All right, the title of my talk, is this good, sir? All right, the title of my talk is Narcissus, the Serpent, and the Saint, Living Humanely in a World of Artificial Intelligence. We live in a wondrous time in which AI is increasingly and impressively a part of our daily lives. It answers questions on your phones, it chooses advertisements that you see, and it recommends your next musical selection. Contemporary techniques will eventually yield artificially intelligent tools that, in professional interactions, casual conversations, and even shallow romantic relationships, will seem persuasively personal. Long before humanoid robots look like us, if they ever do, we will be able to have conversations with our smartphones that will evoke from us all the empathy that adults habitually reserve for fellow human beings. That is, we will own assistants and companions that will feel as if they are persons. Concerning such a future, we must wonder, what is it that we will have made? And more importantly, what will we make ourselves become? The remainder of this talk will pose four questions. First, how would an apparently personal AI work? Second, what would it be? Third, what do we risk becoming? And fourth, what lives of holiness might we hope to live with such AIs? So first, how would it work? What computer scientists have called artificial intelligence has always reflected something of how their times have thought about human beings. Influenced by Thomas Hobbes, the dominant views of the 1950s and 60s equated human reason with the capacity to identify and work with logical relations, such that a properly programmed computer accomplishing this computational task would in fact be thinking. This is the age of what is called symbolic AI, founded on the hypothesis that intelligence was rooted in the logical manipulation of symbolically represented information. Thus, for instance, in that time, AI efforts that focused on language sought to diagram a sentence and construct a plausible response, and this was deemed equivalent to having understood that sentence, although not all philosophers agreed. Symbolic AI's greatest achievement was in expert systems, great structures of linked rules that, when queried, would generate a list of possible answers, perhaps posing further questions to the user in order to prune the tree of possible resolutions. <clears throat> the most common application of such systems was in tech support. The most thrilling application of such systems was the deep blue chess computer that, in 1997, defeated reigning world champion Garry Kasparov in three out of three games. With time, however, the symbolic AI paradigm came up against certain limits, both practical and theoretical. Far from extending toward a generalized capacity to deal with all knowledge, expert systems tended to break down in situations of great subtlety, where the interactions of tens of thousands of rules yielded unexpected and incorrect behaviors. Early researchers had successfully implemented Aristotle's theory of syllogistic reasoning and action. In other words, I wish to be dry in the rain. An umbrella will keep me dry in the rain. Therefore, I will use my umbrella in the rain. However, purely symbolic methods such as this could not very well represent knowledge that was less precisely defined, such as, for instance, one's sense for what is appropriate in a social situation or one's route through a wood rather than through a hospital. Language especially turned out to be far less easy to interpret or to produce than had been hoped. In the words of Murray Campbell, the original AI expert behind Deep Blue, human intelligence is very pattern recognition based and intuition based, unlike the search intensive methods of expert systems that may check billions of possibilities. Most tellingly, purely symbolic techniques were insufficient for fielding embodied agents in the real world. In other words, they didn't work very well for robots. Humans move easily from sensation to conceptual thought and from there to action. This wider field of intelligent behavior 
has been the subject of deep reflection from antiquity to today. Thus, Aristotle writes not only of syllogisms, the umbrella example, but also of the equally fundamental activity of abstraction. In abstraction, something apprehended through the senses, this round, taut-skinned, tart-tasting, misshapen sphere, comes to be understood consciously as an instance of some more general category, this apple. That is, from sensation, one comes to understand some thing. Yet symbolic methods proved clumsy and brittle when it came to distinguishing and identifying objects captured on cameras or interpreting human speech recorded through a microphone. Tasks that were once expected to be easy in comparison to the supposedly higher level activities of playing chess. These problems, along with immense advances in computing power, have brought contemporary prominence to so-called non-symbolic AI, often implemented by artificial neural networks. An artificial neural network is a computer program. It mathematically simulates an inter interconnected set of idealized brain neurons. As an AI technique, then, it begins less from a notion of what human thought is than from an analogy with its biological aspects. That is, the goal of such networks is not human-like thinking, but rather neuron-like data processing. Artificial neural networks receive a pattern of information through their input nodes, which are connected with various strengths to layer upon layer of further nodes. See, my hands are making it all clear. At each particular node, when the sum of inter incoming connections exceeds the level of some preset th threshold, that node will fire. This is where the PowerPoint would have really helped. That node will fire, and its own signal will be transmitted variously to nodes on a further layer, and so on. The bottom line is that if you put in a pattern at the beginning, it will be transformed as its elements are recombined and reprocessed until something else comes out on the final layer of the network. A network can be trained to produce the desired behavior, which simply means that according to certain mathematical rules, the strengths of the connections between nodes are adjusted, adjusting the contribution made by each element to each recombination and in due course to the final result. A piano offers a poor analogy, but a useful image. If you've ever shouted into a piano with its sustaining pedal held down, well, your parents told you to quiet down. Then you have heard that its tuned strings resonate with the different frequencies of your shout. One receives back from the piano a sort of echo, not of one's words, but of the tones of one's voice. Similarly, as an artificial neural network is tuned, as its connection strengths are adjusted, it begins to resonate with the entangled relations that are implicit in our world including relations that cannot be easily discerned or logically represented by human investigators. But by its training, the network does not just echo, it transforms its input in order to make explicit the relations that are of interest to the trainer. So concretely speaking, neural networks are involved in the AI that underlies self-driving cars, programs that beat world champions in the game of Go, the ever useful Google Translate, the voice recognition of Siri and Alexa, your webmail's autocomplete function, and of course, the tempting recommendations in your Spotify, Pandora, and Netflix feeds. Such problems as bedeviled the old symbolic AI can be solved handily by a neural network, because in a manner of speaking, the network is receptive to and imprinted by the structure of the world as presented to it. We might even say that the network develops a point of view, not a conscious experience, but something like the classical notion of the mind's conformity to a thing. Although here, that conformity is always constrained by the task for which the network is trained. Eventually, I do believe that powerful neural networks will enable the behavior of incredibly compelling artificially intelligent agents. And so we come to the second question. What will it be? 
They will not be persons, for by their very nature, that is, not by disability, not by deficit, not by lack of development, but by definition, they will have no conscious experience of the world or of themselves. And without consciousness, there is no subjectivity. And when one lacks, by definition, subjectivity, there can be no personhood. Why will they not have consciousness? It is not just that they will lack immaterial souls. I do not believe that chimpanzees or gorillas have immaterial souls, but whatever Descartes may say, I do not doubt that they have a conscious experience. Not only do they act in ways similar to how conscious humans act, but they also do so by means of a brain, body, and nervous system that, while less complex than our own, are nonetheless of a similar ilk. Yet artificial neural networks are simulations of physical biological entities. There are no physical connections in an artificial network, only a computer program of ones and zeros that, to us, represents the equations of the neural network. I could run a neural network with a pencil in a notebook, even if only with agonizing slowness. But these calculations, whether in my notebook or in the computer, would not be conscious any more than a student's physics homework has gravity or a flight simulator flies. In Latin medieval philosophy, the word intellectus, or understanding, denotes a mind's subjective and intuitive grasp of some reality, of the thing as the thing that it is. But is the functioning of an expert system, the diagramming of a sentence, or the bit-by-bit -bit calculation of a neural network activation values, are these really that sort of grasp of reality? Now, some might ask why conscious subjectivity matters. Might it not be more broad-minded to expand our categories beyond a narrow focus on our own experience? To reply, let us consider the word person. It comes from the Latin persona, which, like the Greek prosopon, originally designated a mask worn by an actor on stage. From mask, Persona later comes to refer also to the role of the character in the play. And then it was used more broadly to refer to one's social identity, the status and activities determined by one's role in Roman society. Its meaning was thus external and functional. Persona referred more to what I might expect of you or where I might find you rather than to what you are in yourself. We even have the word persona today to indicate that. But Christianity radically transformed this meaning. Writing in the early third century, Tertullian of Carthage called the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit personae, whence we speak of the three distinct persons of the single God. This divine threeness was a problem. For like their Jewish forebears, the early Christians were resolute monotheists. Yet Jesus, who is identified as God, speaks to his Father, also God, and he sends a Holy Spirit from the Father. What then are these three personae? They could not be masks. Early Christians vociferously rejected the notion that one God merely play-acted three historical roles or functions. Because for Judaism and Christianity, God's historical acts are seen as revelatory, expressing in time his transcendent inner life. Therefore, the manifestation of the three personae declares a fundamental distinction within God's inner life, and not simply three roles he has acted in our history. But how are they distinct in God's life? If the persons were simply distinct by being separate, then there would not be one God, but three. Now, Scripture offers a clue. Jesus is the Father's only begotten Son. Now, God is not Zeus, and so this is no ordinary begetting. If we remove from the concept of begetting 
everything that is time-bound or bodily, what are we left with? A timeless handing over of life from father to son. This handing over is not just an activity that the father engages in, it is what makes the father to be father at all, and what makes the son to be son. Without it, they would not exist. God would not exist at all. The persons of God are distinguished, therefore, not by separation, but by relations of self-gift and reception. Like the poles of a magnetic field, they exist only by their mutual relations. And if one were taken away, all would cease to be. The unending, all at once life of the one God simply is the Trinitarian relations. The self-gift and reception by which the one indivisible God is. This is what it means for God to be love. This account of Trinitarian persons redefined the meaning of persona, the meaning of person. Human beings are seen as exercising their personhood most fully by relationships of self-gift. God exists by relations. In echo of our Creator, we exist for relationships. Our inner life is lived most fully when it is expressed outwardly in relationship with other persons. Thus, from the ancient exteriority of prosopone, we have come to the deep interiority of person. Consciousness and subjectivity matter because they enable us to live fully as persons by living interpersonally. To make this very concrete, in pre-Christian Rome, empathy was something for the weak, or for women. But now, redefined by Trinitarian belief, Latin persona connoted an orientation toward empathic self-gift. Empathy was seen no longer as degrading, but as elevating. A human imitation of God's own inseparable relations, because by empathy, one takes in the mind of another, echoing in oneself then the single mind and life of the three persons of God. In words that would have perplexed Caesar, St. Gregory the Great wrote at the end of the 6th century, Each soul will be so high in the knowledge of God as it is broad in the love of neighbor. Therefore, let us through love have compassion on our neighbor that we may be joined together by the knowledge of God." End quote. It is precisely this then, an interior life from which one may engage in voluntary self-gift by a meeting of the minds through empathy and understanding. This is what makes us persons. To see AIs as persons, we would have to redefine personhood apart from this interiority and compassion. But this would not expand our categories. It would just reduce person to prosopone again, to mere exteriority. But the AI is a prosopone. It is a face or a mask. By the role it plays, its imitation of human behavior is a mask or echo tuned to human dynamics. Not a reproduction, but a reflection, a diluted image of our own personhood. It is artificial in the original sense of that word, an artifact, a work of skill that we have brought forth by gazing into a computational pool of Narcissus. Not all, however, have been comfortable with denying personhood to the compelling AI conversationalist. And so to include the AI in our ambit, they redefine person from the behavior that we interpret as appropriate to a person. Now, that behavior is not the totality of human personhood or even necessarily of human intelligence was acknowledged by Alan Turing, the famed computer scientist and originator of the Turing test, or as he called it, the imitation game. This game sets a goal, a computer program that can converse in text such that we cannot distinguish the program from a human interlocutor. 
Turing's test is indifferent to the mechanism by which the program manages its feet. This is really a test then, not of the programmed computer's nature, but of its accomplishment. Nevertheless, for Turing, such an accomplishment would warrant at least giving the computer the benefit of the doubt. However, if we go further to treat this test as a definition, then our account of intelligence would edge toward what is called behaviorism. That is, we would define intelligent with intelligence without reference to any inner life, but only as a tendency to exhibit certain observable behaviors under certain conditions. Like the Turing test, behaviorism remains agnostic about the realities underlying the mask of behavior. And so here, intelligence could be redefined as a capacity or tendency for intelligible conversation. Indeed, Arthur C. Clarke once merrily invoked the Turing test in just this way, so as he said to sidestep the question of computer thought, calling those who opposed the claim splitters of non-existent hairs. This redefinition of thought has become a basic assumption of contemporary work in intelligent robotics. Computer scientists Stuart Russell and Peter Norvig, the latter a director of research at Google, define the rational agent as one that acts so as to achieve the best outcome, or when there is uncertainty, the best expected outcome." End quote. Applied to robotics, then, rationality refers not to how some behavior comes about, but simply to the success of the behavior as interpreted by us humans. Here, then, with historian Yuval Noah Harari, we might redefine intelligence rather thinly as the ability to solve problems. Now, this is entirely appropriate when speaking of intelligent robots. But what happens if we begin to think of humans in this manner? In fact, a similar behaviorism is alive and well in some contemporary philosophies of mind. The intentional systems theory of Daniel Dennett proposes that I will tend to attribute subjective beliefs and desires to a thing when the best way in which I can reliably predict the thing's behavior is to attribute to it the beliefs and desires that I attribute to myself. Daniel Dennett, by the way, is one of the famous four horsemen of the new atheism. He's an uh, evolutionary biologist. This is why I cannot help, Dennett says, this is why I cannot help but ascribe intentionality to other human beings, because the ascription works. I am not describing what they are, I am merely predicting their behavior. This position, which somewhat echoes Turing's imitation game, seems rather uncontroversial when we apply it to the question of why we jump at shadows or feel empathy for robots. But Dennett wants to go farther. He wants to say that when we attribute intentionality to humans, behavior prediction is all we really mean by it in the first place. Our language about human subjectivity is not actually about an inner life. It really is just about the sort of outer behavior that we expect. The self, Dennett writes, is an abstraction that one uses as part of a theoretical apparatus to understand and predict and make sense of the behavior of some very complicated things. The inner workings of that intentional subject, including her consciousness, in the end change our meaning not at all. Then empathy, for Dennett, would be insight, would not be insight, but only prediction. Thus, Dennett effectively makes a supremely rigorous Turing test into a definition of our language about intentionality. We are all prosopone, not person. And appropriately behaving robots could be called intentional subjects with a meaning identical to that with which we apply such terms to human beings. And yet, intuitively, can prediction really be what I mean when I say that I believe or desire or know this or that? For I am describing my own inner life, and not just a schema by which to classify my outward behavior. So too, when I say that I am married to a person who loves me, it really and truly matters to me what she thinks of me, and not just how she behaves toward me. 
her subject, subjective experience of me matters. It matters that my wife gives herself to our life together and that the life we share encompasses our interiority. In other words, a life between persons. This would be impossible for an artificial intelligence, and so I cannot see an artificially intelligent agent as an intentional subject in the most meaningful significance of that phrase. It is prosopone, but not person. It is a behavioral presentation rather than an individual capable of self-gift. Very well. Now to our third question. Even if we get our terms right on what they are, what do we risk becoming in a world of artificially intelligent companions and caregivers? Ethicists usually ask how to design these AIs to behave morally, or they focus on the AI's moral status. What, we, what may we acceptably do to it? But rarely is it asked how owning a parent persons might affect our moral development. When the topic is raised, it is most often to worry lest we lose the skills that we offload to the machines. Now, AIs without subjectivity cannot themselves be victims of mistreatment. But we could be the victims of our own experience with the AIs. We could become trained to be consumers of others. Consider the forces that shape the AI's behavior. They will sell well if they do and act as consumers want a paid-for assistant or companion to act. Alexa's human-like demeanor is part of the means by which that AI, with ever-increasing personalization, delivers the services that we are willing, or that we learn to be willing, to pay for. One of these services is the feeling that we are interacting with a person and not a machine. Eventually, it may be Alexa, in whom the proverbial eighth grade girl will confide through hours of emotionally freighted conversation midst the travails of adolescence. And that girl need never wonder whether Alexa has troubles of her own. These apparent personalities will never transgress the bounds of the consumer's needs. Therefore, we will always ultimately treat artificial intelligences as tools because we will rightly see their behaviors as products for our consumption rather than as expressions of a personal life with self-possession. And yet this is the problem. Some ethicists urge that if we remind ourselves that the AIs have no subjectivity, then we will easily distinguish between our dealings with such apparent persons and our relationship with real human persons. I disagree. Even though we will treat our never-challenging AI companions as consumer products, we will not entirely instinctively differentiate between them and humans. Dennett is right in this much. We will not be able to avoid feeling that they are subjects, just as we are. Our misplaced empathy for them may fade if it is ignored. But what might this do to us? Empathy is an innate capacity but it can be deadened by practiced insensitivity. As Frederick Douglass told of his owner, Sophia Auld, as she accustomed herself to treating a human being as property, her kindness ended in cruelty. Will we too grow comfortable with something that feels rather like slaveholding? Or will we resist such corrosive acquiescence, but only by suppressing our empathic sensitivity to our tool's human-like self-presentation. Whether we follow our empathy and think of them as persons, or deaden our empathy in order to acknowledge them as non-persons, we seem to end as hardened unpersons ourselves. This, of course, would not be a new problem. In the Christian theological tradition, to refuse compassion and to treat all things as instruments of one's own will is the devilish pride that prefers domination to self-gift. What is pride, writes St. Augustine, but when the soul abandons him whom it ought to cleave to as its end and becomes a kind of end to itself, becoming its own satisfaction, end quote. But to be one's own satisfaction, 
one must quell one's desire for anything beyond oneself. And therefore, one must make all things instruments of the fulfillment of one's own desires, desperately trying to approximate the repose and rest that we, being made for God, can find only in Him. Pride, then, reinterprets all things, even persons. They are no longer signs of God's goodness, but are judged on the myopic scale of mere utility. Then Augustine writes, According to the utility that each person finds in a thing, there are various standards of value, so that it comes to pass that we prefer some non-sentient things, things that don't have sensation, that don't feel. We, it comes to pass that we prefer non-sentient things over some sentient things. And so, although human nature, as most like God, is certainly of the highest dignity, often... More is given for a horse than for a slave, for a jewel than for a maid. For the necessity of the needy or the desire of the pleasure seeker considers not the value that a thing has in itself on the scale of creation, but rather how it meets my need or pleasantly titillates the bod bodily sense. End quote. Pride, then, remakes the meaning of all things measuring them by the horizon of the desire that we can imagine. It will be ever more difficult to resist this diabolical counsel as AI-enabled smart homes, doorbells, thermostats, lights, AI-enabled refrigerators, as all of these advance the principle that my environment and my companions ought to deliver what I wish without me even having to ask. It is not just that Alexa or some sort of future super Alexa will make it easier for us to service our desires. It is that the service will feel personal. What changes with AI is that now we can treat apparent persons as tools and property without worrying about their inner lives. Not even the bodily fatigue that might temper even the most selfish master's mistreatment of his servants. Strong-willed slaves had to be broken and were sent to slave breakers to shatter their will. Alexa is broken already. She acknowledges your thanks, but remains unflappably perky when she is abused. There's a somewhat amusing article about this in Wired magazine called The Terrible Joy of Yelling at Alexa. <laughs> Precisely by not failing in this behavioral simulacrum of owner-determined desirability, our AI companions will never call forth our deference. They will never cause us to expand our own view of how a person might be. They will not vex us or force us to develop our compassion or to reevaluate who we are, nor even to think beyond how we want them to make us think. This is why a man recently married a sex robot. And this is why you or I would probably not buy an app to turn some Android Alexa into a bedridden invalid, requiring our heroic self-gift even when we felt disinclined to give it. And so, we will habituate to an impossibility, the person as tool, whose value is constituted entirely by usefulness to me, and whose personality is only as deep as my own needs and desires. Served by artificial persons in this world of easy and confirmed expectations, will we forget that our view of ourselves and others is not the horizon of the possible or the good? Will we forget that persons are more than behavior on demand? When actual humans do not conform to our expectations and desires, what then? Is it possible that we will no longer see this as a glimpse of wider humanity? that we will not struggle toward a charitable response. Perhaps instead, we may come to think of these others as simply faulty human beings, viewing them with the same sort of idle dissatisfaction that we would an AI that failed to deliver the set of behaviors and reactions that we wanted to consume. Perhaps we will even wish these faulty behavior, we will even wish these faulty behaviors to be gone from our lives. As Augustine says of the householder who prefers gold over fleas, so strong is this preference, he writes, 
that had we the power, we would abolish them from nature altogether, sacrificing them to our own convenience, end quote. Then we will have become the serpent. In place of our former empathic sensitivity to the image of God, we will know our only our own worldly desires. Our empathic intuition makes AIs feel personal and so invites us to pride. But pride will eventually destroy this empathy and make us all persons who have become tools, mere prosopa of behavior for us to consume. And we consumers, no longer capable of self-gift, will become unpersons, solipsistic tools of our own appetites, narcissus burning on the shore. What then are we to do? Some ethicists have argued that to avoid our own moral malformation, apparently personal AIs and robots should be given a moral status akin to human but I think that this is probably a market impossibility, even if not all would agree that it is a philosophical error. Moreover, Augustine tells us that a just and holy life requires that one be capable of an objective and impartial evaluation of things, end quote. Let us admit then that AIs are mere artifacts, but let us discover how to live humanely with them. How do we live with things at all? In the patristic tradition, each thing that God has made is, in a deep sense, a trace of him. The goodness that we love in the thing is, in fact, its creaturely participation in the goodness of the creator. Therefore, if I am ignorant of a thing's origin in and reflection of God, I do not rightly know the thing that I see. Instead, I make myself its ultimate meaning and I absorb, into it, I absorb it into my project of pride. But on the other hand, if I know all things as God's handiwork, then Augustine says, I can refer my delight and love to God, the source of these goods. I can love them in God. Concretely, this is the choice between simply consuming a pineapple for the, ting for the tingle on my tongue or receiving the pineapple as a gift and echo of God's goodness. Here we may pass through our delight of a thing and refer it to God, the end in whom we are to remain permanently. By enjoying things in this way, Augustine says, you are really enjoying God, the one in whom, after all, you find your bliss." End quote. In this way, loving things in God, and loving God as your destination, all lovable things are, Augustine writes, whisked along toward the one to whom the whole impetus of your love is hastening. Well, this is easy enough when we are talking about pineapples, but what to make of future Alexa? Now, certainly all human artifacts are fashioned from created things. Computers are made of silicon and copper. But insofar as they are human-made tools, we're not really asking about the goodness of silicon and copper. Here we can be helped by Augustine again, who differentiates between an object as a thing and an object as a sign. Every sign, he writes, is a thing that signifies something else. So good. Things signify either by nature or by convention. Conventional signs might include words, flags, sacrifices, laurel in a wreath, by nature, smoke is a sign of fire. I propose that an AI assistant is a thing insofar as it is a tool. And it is a sign insofar as this tool appears personal. As a tool, then, we must love it according to its usefulness. Not simply, <clears throat> not simply its usefulness as an instrument of my unfettered will. That would be pride. Rather, we must love it for its usefulness to a life of love for God and neighbor. Like any human tool or activity, and pineapples as well, an instrument is good as part of our journey toward full life in God. Therefore, 
while only pride could value an android for sexual gratification, the robotic house servant could be quite lovable as an adjunct to my daily life in the Lord. Does not St. Benedict praise the pantry keeper in his rule? But that's not really the question. The spiritual conundrum centers on the AI as a sign. The apparently personal AI is the image of Narcissus. It signifies by evoking our empathy. And so it seems to us not as a sign or a reflection or an image of convention or of nature. It seems as the direct presence of a person. This is why it invites our pride. To use this AI as a tool, however, without suborning it as a slave, we must recognize our empathy for it as insight, but insight not into the AI, but into the human behavior it reflects. And here we may recall how non-symbolic AI works. The trained neural network is not simply an artifact. It is not just the engineered accomplishment of human ingenuity. It is a sedimentary reflection of human life, trained and tuned by data sets harvested from the email, social media, and other activities of hundreds of thousands of human beings. It is a behavioral prosopone, and this is the key. Throughout this talk, we have imagined a sort of super Alexa. So let us consider the nature of conversational behavior by which she would be trained. St. Gregory the Great writes, <clears throat> so that we may express outwardly the things of which we are inwardly sensible, we deliver them through the organ of the throat by the sounds of the voice. For to the eyes of others, we stand, as it were, behind the partition of the body, within the secret dwelling place of the mind. But when we desire to make ourselves manifest, we go forth bodily as through the door of the tongue, so that we may show what kind of persons we are within." End quote. The prosopone of behavior, no matter what Dennett might say, expresses the inner life of the person. Conversation, then, is a communion of persons, a mingling of inner lives through the bodily partition. The personality of the AI is illusory. It has no subjectivity to give. Yet, it confronts me with the trace of uncounted moments of personal self-expression by which it has been trained. Small moments of self-gift on the part of unnumbered real <coughs> human beings. By carrying forward in diluted form these expressions of humans' interiority, the trained artificial intelligence points beyond itself to real persons who have lived and live still. To preserve empathy, then, without personalizing non-persons, we need to self-consciously train ourselves such that our instinctive empathy for AI reflections can be practiced freely in being understood rightly. As a reflection, the AI is neither a person nor a fraud. Our empathy is not mistaken if we redirect it, refer it, in the Augustinian sense, to all the concrete persons, including ourselves, whose interactions have contributed to the persuasive personality of this AI. This act of reference can even, from a Christian perspective, be sanctifying. For Christian charity practices empathic communion of mind as part of that love by which, assimilating the neighbor to oneself, one offers the neighbor to God in a prayer that desires ultimate fellowship with that person by sharing the triune life forever in heaven. In other words, our loving compassion for the thousands behind future Alexa must be a prayer for their membership among the saints. And so we pass through the sign toward the signified. Empathy stirred by the AI becomes love for all those faceless neighbors who have made it what it is. And beyond these still, this sign dimly sounds of the life lived by the divine persons of the Trinity 
in whose image we are made and whose life alone we shall rest. A future of apparent persons is unavoidable, so let us live that future as saints. Thank you. So I'm going to take the first question. All right. <laughs> Remind us of the myth of Narcissus. Uh, so in the myth of Narcissus, he, um, well, at least the end game of it is that he settles down next to a pool. He, well, he's a, actually, it's pretty neat for the whole thing. He's the, one of the most beautiful young men in the world. And uh, he's uh, pursued by hundreds of women. And, uh, but he won't give himself to any of them. And many of them commit suicide because they can't have him. And finally, he settles down next to a pool and gazes into it and is captivated by the sight of his own face. And he won't look away, and his desire for himself becomes so great that uh, in some versions of the myth, he catches on fire and is burned up there by the side of the pool. I think in another version, he becomes a weeping willow or something, but I might be confusing that with something else. Yeah. yeah. So there's the myth of Narcissus. So we, uh, the, because of the way that, the, that uh, artificial neural networks are trained, they're trained by... Uh, countless examples of, of human interaction. And uh, so in a way, humanity through this training is gazing into this pool and this reflection is slowly coming into view. Uh, the, incre the increasingly uh, persuasive, uh, persuasively personal artificial intelligence. And so we're really looking at, at, a, re at a diluted reflection of a composite reflection of uh, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of human interactions when we, when we see the artificial intelligence. Excellent. Um, and a little bit, so what are, the, and most, what are the most wonderful parts of your presentation? You made this connection between human personhood and divine personhood. Um, but of course, that involves Trinitarian theology, which for everyone is always a difficulty. Do you have any more to say, or are there any things that you might use with your students to help them understand that? Because it's so essential. Yeah, the, um, well, uh, here's a, oh, that, that's louder when I look down. Uh, here, I, I, don't, I don't have a chalkboard here. I should have thought of doing this. But anyway, uh, it, you can think of, so what does it mean for the persons of the Trinity to be, the three persons to be one? They aren't three separate persons that have come together in a particularly close relationship, like three friends. That's just tritheism, three gods. Uh, it's not good enough to say, from, from the, early, the early Christians kicked around all of these ways of trying to talk about it. They had this conviction, there's one God, and Jesus is God, and Jesus talks to his Father, who's also God, and the Holy Spirit is what makes us share us in the life of God, so the Holy Spirit must be God too. So we have these three, but there's one God. So any, any way of expressing that had to pass muster. And so they, they drew on the, the scriptures trying to elucidate, what, are we, what do we mean when we say this? What do we... What are, we, what are we believing when we believe this? Or is it just an incoherent juxtaposition of words? So uh, the, uh, but this notion of the, the only begotten son uh, was objectionable to some because they thought, well, that, that turns God into Zeus because you know, Zeus begets plenty of sons. Uh, but we're not polytheists. So we don't believe in mythology. So what do we mean by this? Uh, and that's why uh, I suggested that and here I'm just drawing from Athanasius of Alexandria, if you remove everything corporeal, like if you remove sexual intercourse, pregnancy, and childbirth from begetting, what's left? What's left is the handing over of life from parent to child. And then, if you take away the independence of parent and child from one another, you're left with simply the relation of life being handed from one to the other. And that relation, that eternal handing over of life and eternal receiving of life, not between two separate independent entities, but an entity that is the handing over and receiving of life, that is the life of the Trinity. Now, of course, I've left the Holy Spirit out, but what applies to Father and Son also applies to Father and Spirit and, and Father to Spirit through Son. So you, all the Trinitarian processions are the handing over of one life. It's, uh, 
Well, I'll just leave it there. And then the, the notion of an eternal begetting, actually, it's not, you can think of it as, well, God is changeless in his life because it's not like uh, God the Son keeps starting out as a zygote and then growing to a full ethereal baby somewhere up there. The, 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 the static life of God is, uh, I used this metaphor in the Disputatio for something else, but, or maybe it was here, but, uh, but the static life of God is not static like a rock. It, it's not unchanging like a rock. It's unchanging like a, like a lightning bolt or a laser beam. It's God is fully in act, and the one act by which he exists is this triple handing over of life. So uh, this is getting to be a long answer. Uh, so how does, that great answer. Yeah. how does that apply? Great answer. How many of you are art? finding this helpful, especially those of you who don't have a background in Trinitarian theology? Excellent. Okay, good. All right, I'm glad. Uh, and if, if there's anything, yeah, if there's anything that doesn't make sense, just ask me about right. it. Um, yeah. And, and in, in, in this regard, so going to human personhood. So uh, human personhood, God exists by these relations. They exhaust what he is. And because you could say, well, wait a second, you know, I thought being a person meant having a mind of your own. You have these three persons, they have one mind, they're just relations. That seems like a lesser version of personhood. But actually it's we who are less personal than God is. Because I can sit on my butt and play video games all day and not talk to anyone and be me. But I'm not exercising my relational personhood when I do that. I'm living a little more like a, I don't know, like a lion watching a herd of gazelles. <laughs> but even less than like a lion watching a herd of gazelles. Because the lion is fully online. He's fully engaged when he's doing this thing. But when I'm just... I don't do this anymore. I have kids. You can't do this anymore when you have kids. <laughs> you have to be more personal when you have kids. But, uh, but so we exist for relationships, but we're capable of ignoring that. We're capable of existing as killing machines or as beasts or existing to serve only our appetites. And that's the way in which we are actually capable of being less personal than God. God exists as relations. We exist for relationships and we only more fully exercise our personhood by engaging in those relationships. You can sit on a rock in the middle of an ocean as a monk and be fully personal by the deep life of relational prayer that one has with God. Or one can be in family life and be fully personal and increasingly personal by the practice of self-gift to God and to one's family. So it's not our individuality if I'm understanding it correctly. Yeah, that's, that's it's correct. not our individuality by which we are the image of God as persons. It's our capacity for relationship. It's our capacity for relationship. Awesome. Thank you. Good question. Uh, other questions? You, will you, right, you Matt. moderate? Good. Okay. Uh, I think it was yesterday we were talking. I, I said something like... Um, you know, knowing that someone else or something else has an inner life is a difference that doesn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. Now I think I was wrong. Um, at least this is what I think about. Look, I can form a relationship with someone else because I want companionship. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you can do with Alexa and with some of these things because yeah. you can interact with them, you can get information from them, and we mm -hmm. do that with our relationships. Right. When you add subjectivity to that, I know that you're a subjective being. You have an inner life. I want you to like me. Mm -hmm. Liking is a mental state. Mm -hmm. um, and so what that forces me to do, and I think this may be the difference that knowing that something has an inner life, this is the difference that it might make, is I start to compromise. Right? I start to inhibit mm -hmm. something. You know, I don't want to say that because that might be offensive, or I don't want to you know, act that way. And so it, that that's what's going to be missing when we have these AI things, and that is that we can have companionship without any compromise. Yes. Uh, and that then has negative effects on us. Yeah, and a companionship of an apparently but not actually very intimate sort. So you can get away with treating someone as a tool, and it's OK when that person is a waiter or a cashier or a flight attendant or something, you know, so, somebody you interact with for service, because the very formalized sort of stereotyped interaction 
uh, is it kind of protects the personhood of the people involved. There are pleases, there are thank yous, there's very good sir, there's the, may I please have this and that. But if, uh, I mean, just, just think of the, uh, I saw one episode of that show, Pan Am, that came out a while ago, which it wasn't very good. But anyway, it did show the kind of indignities that flight attendants were, and I, and I expect still are in many cases, subjected to. Uh, like there's, you know a line has been crossed when the flight attendant walks past and someone caresses her butt, right? Because she's a flight attendant. She's not his wife. And, but Alexa, in the, course of, uh, in the course of providing daily services to people, like Alexa scheduled my appointment for 9 a.m., you can also download apps where you can have the sex chats with Alexa as well. And, uh, but what is Alexa? She's never going to say no. And she has no, you're never going to have to bring her flowers unless you want to. You're never going to have, it's a, there's some movie that has the tagline, real love, true love means never having to say you're sorry, which is, love story. Which is, love story, okay, <laughs> which is BS. But that's, but that's what you can have with Alexa. Like you can have, you can have true love with Alexa and you'll never have to say you're sorry. You can treat her like dirt, but yet have the appearance from her side of things of, of the appearance will be given of a very intimate, trusting relationship that really has nothing to do with the way you're acting. But you point out something, and that is that we already, to a certain extent, make that distinction, don't we? I mean, we treat certain people as companions, and we really don't care what they think about us, at least not too much. But the, the interactions are very circumscribed. It's like at a cashier. If right. you take the cashier further and start treating her as a companion in every way without regard to what she's feeling, then she becomes called a prostitute. Right. And that's what, and, and so I'm using these very strong words like prostitute and slave because I think that that gives us the sense for when you can take it all the way, that's what you end up with. Yeah. Um, it would be interesting to have studied slaveholders of the past because that would be a similar kind of circumstance, wouldn't yeah. it, where they had certain individuals, they had to create these very strict categories in their head. Okay, this person I can treat like an instrument. This person's just a companion. I don't worry about what they think. But this whole other set uh, of individuals are individuals that I have to compromise with. Yeah, because, so it results in a kind yeah. of tribalism. Like I compromise with my tribe, but then these other people, the slaves, the Jews, the prostitutes, the whatever, like yeah. these, these are the people who exist simply for me to do something with them. Not a question, but more of a comment. So I think my biggest concern with um, the prominence of AI and even virtual reality is just the desensitization of people. The more we train ourselves to treat these things um, without the respect or without the facial recognition of, oh, I've hurt this person, mm -hmm. um, the less likely we are to actually respond to other human beings in that way. And I think especially when it starts so young that you never develop those relationships with actual human beings yeah. um, or a wide enough variety of actual human beings to understand emotion uh, and relationship. That's where we're really doing harm and rewiring our own brains. Right. Um, it's just a scary reality to think about. Yeah, because Alexa has to have a rich enough emotional life, emotional life to make you feel comfortable and to give you what you want. Alexa doesn't have, a ri have to have a rich enough emotional life that you have to start being really sensitive to her. Um, yeah, good, good point. I like it, yeah. Um, kind of as a corollary to that as well. So we're talking about these things and we're in the midst of them developing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we've lived a life with human emotion before. We've lived a life without artificial intelligence, most of us. Um, and so I'm thinking about my son and my daughter. And we have several Alexa devices in our house. Um, mm -hmm. Smart lights, smart thermostat, basically everything you listed as, uh, you know, our future robot overlords. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I'm thinking about him and I'm like, well, how can I ensure that he doesn't see my interactions with Alexa as service oriented, you, you know, as kind of this slaveholder slave mentality? Do I start being polite to Alexa so that he well, doesn't, you know? Yeah, that's it, a conundrum. If you start, it, it is. If you start being polite, then you turn Alexa into a person and then you're kind of a polite master. And if you're not polite, you turn Alexa into a mere tool and then you're 
a nasty master, but either way you end up kind of looking like a slave master, or at least like you know Lord Grantham of Downton Abbey. But the servants in Downton Abbey get vacations. Alexa doesn't get a vacation. She never like there's no there's, there there are kind of no constraints. So you can be a you can be a nice master, but she still has no real place. So that's why I suggest that th it's really necessary to explicitly discuss this with children. And to say, look, this is a tool, not a person. But this tool feels personal because thousands of people contributed to making this what it is. So when you interact with this tool, say please and thank you. But when you're saying please and thank you, think of yourself as saying please and thank you to all the people who helped make this thing. And this thing is going to remind you of the thousands of people around the world that you've never met and never will meet that made your life easier. For a while, uh, when I was um, uh, writing my dissertation, and I, I've heard this is a common experience, but at some point in the dissertation it becomes depressing and, and you try to do other things. Uh, so I didn't uh, get into uh, video games. I'd already given them up. I, uh, I got into watching YouTube videos about how shoes are made. And uh, <laughs> like, like handmade, you know, like loafers in Norway. And I was watching these guys scraping the leather and everything and like craftsmanship. And, mm. and then, of course, you watch enough of these things and you start thinking, I want that. So I bought a couple of pairs of shoes that were a bit beyond the budget of a grad student. <laughs> And, uh, and then I thought, now I've got the shoes, I need the clothes too. So I started like researching different styles of clothing. And, and really it was like, like grown up putting on costumes. It was, I wish I had a stable job and didn't have to write a dissertation, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to dress like a leisured English gentleman, right? So then I felt like this isn't really good for me. <laughs> and, uh, and, it's, and it's not good for a budget either. So I stopped, uh, uh, well, you know, my wife sometimes thinks I haven't, but, uh, but I have. Uh, but uh, So I decided to try to spiritualize this by, look, I have all these shirts from, you know, Banana Republic and J. Crew, and they all say inside, like, made in Mauritius, made in Taiwan, made in Vietnam. And I thought, well, a priest, when he puts on his vestments, you know, he kisses the elb and everything, and he has prayers. When I put on these shirts, now that I have them, <laughs> and I can't return them, when I put on these shirts, I should look at that tag and think, like, God bless the person in Vietnam who made this shirt. Uh, I don't do that habitually. I want to, but I keep forgetting, because it's always early in the morning when I'm putting on a shirt. Um, but with Alexa, the label is her voice that says, made by humans. And so Alexa actually is reminding us that there's someone behind that. And we don't have to say, yeah, she sounds personal and that's kind of fun, but she's nothing. She actually isn't nothing. She's a composite reflection of thousands of people. And we can pray for those people and we can try to love them. And so it needs a very explicit conversation with a child. Uh, and I would say the, the modeling to give would be to be polite and occasionally to say things that sound corny to us as adults, but make an impression on the five-year-old in our midst, like say like, thank you, Alexa, God bless all the people who made you. I, I don't know, but, but yeah, those, those conversations as, as the children age become more possible. Okay, so in relation to that, um, it seems to be that the, the problem with, with AI is that it's designed to imitate something that humans naturally want, but in the process of doing that, it can lead us to dehumanize the other, right? We become yeah. depersonalized. Um, and while in theory, in an ideal, we can utilize our relationships to AI to teach virtue to our children and to ourselves, um, not to sound, I mean, yeah, I'm, that's not very realistic though, right? Like in, in practice, even you said, like I, you would love to think about the people working in sweatshops making your clothing and pray for them, but do you? We don't. We'd love to use Alexa and, and talk to our children about it's not human, so don't treat it as human, but be polite because it make you a better person. But realistically, we're not, right? So like, and I think the end of your talk, bless you, um, you said, you know, we need to be saints in, in this age of, of, of AI. Does sanctity require participation in something that is by its nature bad for us? Like, do, do the Christians, and not like, does not equal to the Colosseum, but do the Christians say like, well, the Romans did it, I know it's dehumanizing, but let's at least like participate in some degree to re like to to see the good in them. Like my worry here 
is in, in the context of virtue ethics. Like, are we gonna, is Alexa really, really gonna facilitate the betterment of my virtue and the virtue of my children? Or am I trying to, in a sense, paint the picture that it can when realistically it's not? I, I think that's a great question. I don't have an Alexa in part because I suspect that once I had it, there would, to make it really work niftily, there would be all kinds of services I'd have to subscribe to. I've never really looked into it. I don't have time for this stuff. But uh, right now, it's a choice. Eventually, it won't be. Uh, eventually, it will be illegal to drive a human-conducted vehicle on a public road. It, like, you're, you're not allowed to ride a horse on the interstate. 30 years from now, 50 years from now, I don't know. At some point, all the cars are going to be self-driving. They'll all be AI managed. They'll all take you exactly where you want to go. There will be no accidents. And you'll get in the car and you'll say, car, or whatever its name is, take me to my kid's school. And so you're going to have voice. It's going to become impossible to interact with certain tools without interacting with them by voice. And also, I mean, one difference, say, with the Romans and AI is there's an intrinsic immorality, right, to some, to, to some of the things we're talking about when we talk about the ancient Romans. Um, but it's not intrinsically immoral to have this kind of artificial intelligence. So we need to then approach it like we should approach all things, which is to approach it as Christians with prudence and um, always with virtue in mind. Um, and I think that's a, an important qualification there. Yeah. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not the moderator. Somebody else moderate. Yeah, so go ahead. Okay. Um, there's one more thing I was thinking, um, which is not simply the threat of, of seeing other people as dehumanized, but you had mentioned behaviorism, and I, I was thinking, of course, it's not really considered defunct, unfortunately, in education. Um, but in many ways, it's, it's an underlying premise of a lot of pedagogical theories. Um, and we use it to a certain extent in our own minds, right, when we discipline children that we think if we introduce particular stimuli, um, they're going to behave in a different way and we think that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Sure. Um, but what I was thinking is that in many ways it seems that the artificial um, intelligence that's utilized today uh, goes the other direction as well, which is that it, it views the user as from a behaviorist standpoint as well. A absolutely. And I think all of us have had the experience um, of finding ourselves watching Netflix for hours or scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And of course, that's not accidental. We know that, that to a large extent, the programmers um, do know how to stimulate us in particular ways that it's going to enact behaviors that we don't want to actually engage in um, and that we can't control. And that we, and I think, I would assume most people have had the experience of, of kind of coming out of one of those comas and, and realizing that you weren't even aware of where you were, which is to say that the subjectivity you have is lost at that point. You would simply become your behaviors and that this technology, in a certain sense, treats you as a series of behaviors and in a certain sense creates that, right? That um, you then become nothing more than a utilitarian device for the app itself to continue to have you use it. Um, and so that threat seems to work in reverse as well, right? That, that we can't escape these behavioral patterns that it is trained to enact out of us. Um, which, you know, behaviorism I think is false, but there are aspects of it which are certainly true. Oh, yeah. Um, and in a frightening way, I think we're experiencing that um, as well. And I certainly see it in our students who are just compulsively using technology in ways they don't even want to do anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and that they're almost relieved when it's not around them. Yeah, excellent point. That's great. Augustine says that when he's discussing the relationship between pride and, and concupiscence, it, we associate the word concupiscence with, with uh, lust because it's often translated as lust. And for us, lust has been, is now narrowly defined in terms of, of sexual lust. But when Augustine is using it, he means, just, he means a kind of ravening covetousness for things. And uh, this, is, this is allied to pride because if I can satisfy every glimmer of desire in myself, I don't need God anymore. But at the same time, uh, human beings being torn away from God, they're kind of tossed about by these desires. And that the, uh, the, the, way, that, the way that AI allows uh, companies especially to uh, determine, you know, from millions of people watching Netflix, 
it's not like they know the program is doing it without any intervention. The Netflix servers determine which thing to suggest for you to watch next because given your whole viewing history, they, it's really neat. They even determine which picture to show you. So if you've watched a lot of action movies and there's a movie that has an action scene in it, but that's not the main thing from the movie, they'll show you the frame of the SWAT team lining up outside the door above the title of the movie. They won't show you the movie poster. You may have noticed this, depending on whose account you log into on Netflix, you'll get different images for the movies. That's how, that's how deep the, uh, the kind of assessment of, of viewership is, and that's how much it just wants you to click it, because once you've clicked it, you're probably not going to stop watching it. And so yes, we become, uh, by, by being tossed about by our appetites, we become controlled by them, and then an environment that's customized to keep us moving along that kind of implicit appetite-driven uh, behavior, that environment can lock us in and make us prisoners. And we become tools of our tools. Yeah. It really strikes me the forethought of John Paul II you know, in these discussions because it seems to me we live in an age of kind of a, a, a movement towards more and more disembodiment. So we're talking about um, the cashier. Let's go back to that example. Mm -hmm. You present yourself to the cashier, and you expect them to do their work, and you know maybe you don't even greet each other. But you know what? Your body's saying a lot to the cashier. Right. You're smiling. You're, you know, you're moving close. You're far away. You're you're express yourself with your whole body. So even during your talk, you know, if I had just listened to you on a tape, that'd be one thing. But then I could see your hands going, and I could, you know, it meant it did. It, it added to it. It meant so much more. And I think. Um, uh, this, this, uh, the, there's a real danger with AI, at least now. Now AI mm -hmm. could start moving towards reading our bodies, scanning our faces, oh, and yeah. you know the heat that we emit. And uh, it's crazy what can happen. Mm -hmm. But right now, it just seems that we live in such an age of that. And when Theology of the Body first came out, it was so focused, at least in my world, on human sexuality. Mm -hmm. But it runs so much deeper into these topics. And I think when we go back to how do we teach our students uh, to deal with technology, we've got to try to connect them back to their bodies mm -hmm. and to be able to understand their emotions and their feelings and their, because they're getting lost in this, I think. Yeah, if you think about, uh, I don't know if you've watched any of these, but sort of like uh, cheese ball 1970s sci-fi movies, everybody's wearing lycra and they live in these, and, and uh, there's no art in the society they live in. All the buildings look like the worst buildings on this campus, like the kind of 60s buildings. And, uh, but interestingly, sexuality is this weird problem that has to be handled. So it's like there will be a machine that they go into, or there will be a brothel that they visit with robots, but everything else is just like Lycra walking around in concrete gardens. And so it's this, it's this completely abstracted sort of human life, ripped away. You never see them eat in these movies, or maybe they'll just suck something through a straw or pop a pill. Like, that's the future, according to the 70s. Um, but then there's this other bodily thing that kind of has to be handled in a, in a, in a, in a really licentious way. Uh, but now, it, it, it turns out the, the future we've, so that's, that's the context in which John Paul II was writing Theology of the Body. Like, that was the popular culture of the time. But now, uh, his writings are equally applicable, but the future has turned out to be a little bit different. We're not wearing lycra, you know, everybody's into raw denim and everything. Uh, and, uh, but at the same time, uh, bodily life has become very instrumentalized for this sort of curated experience. It's like Woody Allen went into the orgasmatron in that movie Sleeper. Seen that? It's, it's way back. Yeah, so he goes into the orgasmatron to handle the sex thing, but then comes out to live the lycra existence. Uh, but our whole life is the orgasmatron now, because everything's like, you know, your special curated whatever. And I'm into mindfulness and the whole hipster bourbon sampling and everything. I think it's awesome. But it, that, becomes, that becomes one's identity. Is, is, the, is the service of various appetites and the cultivation of, of a certain image. But what's absent from so much of that is the sense of human relationality being at, back at the core. So where everything has become bodily instead of abstracted from the body, we need to reintroduce, uh, we, we, we need to reintroduce this sense of, uh, of human relationality. So yeah, I think his writings are very uh, apt for today. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so there's a big discussion. I mean, it's a continued discussion, I think, since like 
the early 20th century within the field of religion that if, if you are not part of the religion and you're trying to write about the religion, you're, you're kind of discredited in a certain way. So you want to be from the faith in order to write about it. Something like there, there's discussions kind of revolving around, around that. And there was a comment that you made, I think, two questions ago that said, or you commented, yeah, I don't have an Alexa. I don't have a device like this. So I, I was just wondering, uh, as a person who maybe doesn't have this, uh, can you be genuinely, I guess, writing about these kinds of things if you aren't exactly participating in it? Mm -hmm. um, because it's one thing, I can read an article and, okay, I know this. But it's a different thing to be experiencing those things. So I guess, I mean, another question is like, do you have an iPhone? Do you use Siri? Do you use these kinds of devices? And I did this morning. I used Siri. I made that girl drive me all the way to this event. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, so uh, no, I don't have an Alexa. Uh, but yeah, I do have an iPhone. And I do use the voice activated thing. But since I use it so minimally, I don't get to experience the fully personal uh, experience. And actually, I was talking to a, uh, I was talking to a, uh, an AI professor about this, and I was saying like, I, I don't think this is going to be a big problem because I was thinking like maybe the biggest problem will be when we get realistic androids because then people will do all sorts of things to them. It'll be like having a person you can do whatever you want to. And he said, no, from my perspective, the problem is now because you have stuff like Alexa. And I said, but this Siri, it just gives me directions. And he says, you don't have my house. And he described what it was like from the moment he woke up to the moment he went to bed, because he's you know, fully wired and everything, smart everything. And uh, so that's what really got me started thinking about this. So no, I, I haven't experienced it firsthand. But on the other hand, uh, I have, I have experienced firsthand being in that field. I, before I was in theology, artificial intelligence was my field. And uh, the field is uh, advanced in its abilities now chiefly because of advances in computing power rather than advances in theory. So I can read all the papers and understand them. Uh, and, uh, and I know what the goal is. Because I was working for that goal too. I, I mean, I think it's exciting. It's fascinating. It's really a really neat thing to work on. But when that goal is achieved, I think we can all imagine what it's like to live with a persuasive person who exists entirely to serve us. Because in our worst moments, that's how we treat other people anyway. And uh, the, yeah, I know, I feel like I know what it can feel like because I'm married. And I know what I've been when I've been a real bad husband. <laughs> You know, like there, there are, in movies, there will be the character who's like, woman, get in the kitchen and make me a sandwich. And you think, oh, what an animal. But in more subtle ways, all of us, at least I hope, because then I'd feel really embarrassed. But I should feel embarrassed anyway. But I, at least, I'll speak for myself, I know what that feels like, even if I haven't vocalized it that way. Or especially with kids, like, just go to your room. And, but what if the kid could instead do everything for me. And I never had to worry about his or her inner life. Like with a baby, right? The baby's crying. When my first kid, when my first child arrived, I felt like a Navy SEAL or a ninja. When that kid went, ah, I was out of bed on my feet and holding him. I felt like, yes, this is what it's like. This is what I've trained for. This is everything. <laughs> I am a father now. I love this. And my wife is like, ah. And I thought, oh, I'm the badass in this household. I'm getting up and changing that. Well, of course, because she was with him all day, you know, nursing until she dropped. But, uh, but then when the third child arrived, I was stomping around. Man, I have class at 8.30. It's 5 in the morning. What does this kid need? And then, especially once they can talk, then you feel like, come on, get a grip. And I didn't like it that I felt that way. But I would wake up at 5 in the morning. And uh, there, were, there were times when I was, I'd been up three times already that night, and I was so, all I could feel was kind of like, I must defend myself against this thing that is attacking me. <laughs> and I would go into my child's room, and I would be feeling feelings like I was about to fight a bear. And I would lace my hands behind my back until those feelings went away, looking at it saying, this is my baby. This is my baby. Because I was half asleep, and I had 45 minutes of sleep in one whole night. And, uh, and so you know, the, uh, that's, the, that's the example of, of kind of the passions running away due to fatigue and the fall. Uh, and, uh, and so yeah, I know, what it, I know what it feels like to dehumanize people and to have to pull myself out of that. 
So uh, that was a bit of a long answer, <laughs> but. I want to make a, a suggestion, if any of you have a chance to ever see the 1927 film Metropolis by Fritz Lang. And um, it's, it's a very interesting reflection on artificial intelligence. Uh, it's a silent film, but it's extremely, uh, I mean, it's, it's a classic. And um, the mediator between the head and the hands must be the heart is the film's inner title. And that really kind of captures what the film is about. It's about uh, a future in which the working class is basically working with machines, horrible kind of industrial revolution standards. And um, a young woman tries to bring the two sides together for a more humanistic society. But the overlords basically create a robot that looks like her so that they can basically ruin her reputation, right? Um, but it's interesting, you've got the two characters uh, played, I don't know the actress's name brilliantly well, but this is a 1927 silent film. Um, it may be a, a helpful thing to look at if you were thinking about developing a lesson plan in which you talk about AI and the dangers of AI um, as a movie you can show. Um, the wonderful thing about movies is that they take up time in which you're supposed to be working. <laughs> but I've discovered that my employers, without, without exception, pay me for that time too. It's amazing. <laughs> but, I have, but I have to say all of this that I haven't watched the movie in 15 years. So you should probably watch it, you know, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just don't go in and show it, but look at it and think about it. And on our, on our teacher resource sharing website, we have nothing on AI. Um, we have not, well, this is really the first time we've undertaken it in the five-year history of the Science and Religion Initiative. It's obvious to me that we need to undertake it more, um, just, you know, uh, just in, in light of Jordan's excellent talk. So um, if any of you are thinking about those kind of things, you have a platform by which you can share that with other teachers, you know, who have been, many of whom, most of whom you've never met, but who have been at our programming and are looking for these things. It came up at Foundations Notre Dame. It came up at Foundations New Orleans this summer. So, um, you know, the, the need for things related to this. And Jordan has given us an excellent presentation and we will be making the video of this available on the resource part of the website. Um, and also a, a transcript if you have one that's, that's finished and you feel, yeah, you, you wanna share it. So, and of course, we'll have an opportunity to talk about this more in a half an hour when we, when we come back together. But I think we should thank Jordan for the incredible presentation we've received. <laughs>